Live from the Mandalay Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Insight 2014. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube for flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. We are here live in Las Vegas for IBM Insight, which is IBM's big premier, big data show. And uh, in February, the Cube will be at IBM Interconnect, which is a consolidation of all three shows of Pulse, Impact, and uh, Innovate. IBM's going to the mega show model. We're excited to be part of that. We are live inside the social media uh, experience, digital experience lounge put on by the social media team doing social business at IBM. Great job, it's called Insight Go. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media with my, my co-host Dave Vellante, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media and chief analyst at wikibond.org. And Jeff Kelly, uh, big data analyst at Wikibond to break down the news of the day. Talk about big data, industry news. This is our segment where we will share with you our thoughts and analysis and of course our opinions on the news. So Dave, um, top news today in the world is- Twitter, John. Um, Twitter yeah. earnings were out, I'm mean, obviously all over Twitter the- Twitter was uh, getting crushed earlier, it was down six points, it's, it's pulled back a little bit or, or you know, there's been some buying so it's got some support. It's down about four and change today. But I mean, John, you were, uh, Listen to the conference call, you were analyzing the, the results. What's your take on, on, on Twitter? Is this an overreaction? What, in terms of the stock drop? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, first of all, Twitter's misunderstood in, in Wall Street and in, in, in the mainstream as well. I think Twitter uh, is a phenomenal company. I'm really bullish on Twitter. I think what they have is an amazing real-time notification network in the moment. Dick, um, Dick the CEO, Costello, uh, Costello Costello, whatever how he puts it, Costello, um, is an amazing guy because he, he understands FeedBurner, which is a company that no one ever remembers, but they basically manage all the RSS feeds which sold to Google. He understands this real-time web really, really well. I think he also, Dave, understands the value of the fabric that they've built on a global basis. And I think, I like how he's not wavering off his vision. I think that he's holding the line good and he's getting hammered because the metrics that he's being evaluated on are really not the right metrics for Twitter. They're called monthly active users and daily active users, monthly active users, MAUs as they say, really more of a Facebook metric. Monthly average users doesn't really um, encapsulate the value of Twitter, I'll tell you why. Because it's very ephemeral in nature and how people use it as a notification real-time network is not like Facebook. Facebook is a completely different animal than Twitter. Facebook is a place that goes and you're seeing that segmentation be much more of an older demographic, but Twitter is about the people and, the, and that is a really fundamental thing. And so our big vision, as you know, with SiliconANGLE and, and uh, the work we're doing with the CrowdChat Venture is we believe that relationships will matter and Twitter has that. Second thing is, is that Twitter's now going to new metrics around what they call the cohort analysis. Again, focusing on the people. That's a big data problem and they're focused on 100%. Third thing about Twitter that's happening that no people, not a lot of people understand is there's a new market that's developing on top of Twitter that's going mainstream with their user base. That is a consumption market. And you hear Dick, Dick the CEO, talk about the production and then the non-logged in users. What he really means by that is there are people consuming Twitter on the backs of the existing core base of Twitter, which means it's ultimately a content play. So you're seeing value coming out of them in the real time moments, news breaking, the elections, the World Cup, things like that we can all point to, but there's two markets, production and consumption. And you know, CrowdChat again proves that immersive in the moment programming is working for users, and I think that's what Twitter's all about. And they are years away from breaking out, in my opinion, in terms of the real value, so I, I could consider Twitter a buy. Yeah, well I think too that the Twitter itself's trying to figure it out. I mean, what happened in July is, you know, Twitter um, had given guidance in the previous quarter, and it blew away the guidance, and so the stock went through the roof, uh, but the guidance was very conservative. And then what happened this time is they missed you know, the, the, the consensus, and so now the stock's getting crushed. I think Twitter's trying to figure out, okay, what well, should we guide? Because what a company who has good visibility will do is they'll say, okay, here's our guidance. They'll beat it by a little bit. They'll just get consistent, predictable earnings, and Twitter hasn't figured that out yet. Well, I, I think they have, Dave. I think you look at the earnings call, a sentiment of, of the executives, they are hard-lined on staying on the vision. And I think, you know, you don't see the pandering, so they're not reacting to long, Wall Street too much. You know, they're checking the boxes, they're working with the analysts, they've got investor relations. 
they are really in it for the long game. I can hear that in the management. The issue with Twitter is, one, they got to increase the revenue base, which they're doing, and then the second thing is, they still have this baggage on their back around the developer community. So they had their, their developer event called Fabric, which I thought was a good sign they're targeting mobile developers, Crashlytics. If they can create some stability from a credibility standpoint in the developer community and an embrace and growing ecosystem, then they will be a, the, the home run uh, that, that everyone wants them to be. But I think that's a wild, wild a ways down the road. But Dave, they're in it for the long game. And, and, I, and I'm psyched to see them not waver off the vision. So, we also have Jeff Kelly here with us. And Jeff, we were at uh, Big Data NYC last week, concurrent with Hadoop World and Strata. Uh, we had our big capital markets event. You gave a big presentation. We had this awesome panel with Peter Goldmacher, Amy O'Connor, and Abi Mehta. The sparks were flying. Uh, give us your summary of that event and your research. Sure, so the, the event was great. We had, a, we had a great time in New York. Um, so that, you know, really the summary is we tried to help the Wall Street community, the investment community, understand the, the big data market from uh, the perspective of where to place your bets. Uh, there's a lot of talk uh, about, obviously, all the benefits big data can provide to, uh, to companies, and there's a lot of vendors in this space. You know, the, vendor mar the vendor market is exploding. There's new startups coming out of the woodwork all the time for, at different levels of the big data stack. So the question from the perspective of an investment uh, thesis is, well, where do you place your bets? Do you place it on some of the, uh, these new companies that are emerging? Do you place it on some of the, uh, the old stalwarts, IBM here at IBM uh, Insight? Do you place it on, uh, do you place them somewhere else? And, and our investment thesis essentially is that while there is certainly going to be lots of value uh, created in the vendor community, the, the overwhelming majority of value related to big data is going to be created by practitioners. That is. It's going to be created by companies that are applying big data technology services approaches to uh, you know, rejuvenate their businesses, to find new lines of business, to find efficiencies, new ways to uh, improve profitability. Uh, of course, there's going to be a lot of new companies, uh, new startups, new companies that create completely new industries. Um, companies like Uber, companies like Netflix. So uh, our investment thesis is really that it's going to be the practitioners that drive the most value, and from, from uh, an investment perspective, if you can tease out who those companies are, who are the companies that are applying big data most effectively, that's where we'd place our bets now. That's easier said than done because as we've talked about, and I talked about on the panel, uh, we talked about as, as well in the presentation, is that it's, this stuff is difficult, it's hard. Um, you know, just being here at Insight for the last two days, going to some sessions and listening to some, some of IBM's uh, early big data customers, and they kind of lay out these, uh, you know, they've got these slides, here's, here's what our infrastructure looks like, and it's, it's extremely complex. This is hard stuff, so just uh, trying to identify those companies that are using big data doesn't mean those are going to be the winners, it's the ones that are using it most effectively. Um, and if you could, but if you can tease out who those companies are, that's where we suggest uh, you think about placing your bets in terms of uh, investments in this market. So talk a little bit about what you've seen at, uh, at Insight. Uh, you've been here for now for a couple of days, going to mm -hmm. a bunch of the sessions, you're probably at the keynotes, um, doing some breakout sessions, talking sure. to some customers, net it out. Well, it's interesting. So when, in our uh, big data analytics adoption survey, you know, we found that around 30, about a third, 33, 34% of early adopters of big data are using Hadoop and or NoSQL, um, which we kind of consider the foundational technologies of big data and really where uh, most of the innovation's coming from. Now, when you look at the IBM customer base, naturally they're going to be a little bit more conservative. Um, and what I've seen here over the last couple of days is a lot of the sessions uh, focused on big data and analytics, a lot of the customers, the IBM customers, are doing really interesting things, but not, I would say, lower, lower than that 33% uh, threshold are actually using some of these new technologies like Hadoop and NoSQL. We see, I see a lot more of companies using things like uh, DB2 with Blue Acceleration. I see companies doing things with uh, IBM Pure Data, their Natiza appliance. Uh, things with SPSS, a little bit with Watson, not too much, that's still kind of on the cutting edge, uh, even for IBM customers. Uh, so what I'm seeing is kind of this balance between practical application of big data using, uh, trying to leverage the investments you've already made from an IBM perspective, you're an IBM customer, so you know, I've, I've, I've invested in DB2, I've invested but those, in pure uh, data, so but we're but seeing them doing a lot of those Are those scalable, Jeff, though? I mean, talk cases. about that investment, but use case. Take that DB2, is it scalable, and what are some of the issues the customers have? Well, uh, DB2 is interesting because they, uh, IBM has kind of doubled down on DB2, uh, taking the approach that, look, we need to help our customers get more value from DB2, so that, uh, in line with that, they've, 
uh, released what's called Blue Acceleration, essentially an in-memory columnar uh, capability that can be applied to existing DB2 um, installations. The idea there is that you can significantly reduce um, you know, your storage footprint, significantly increase performance for both analytics and to some extent transactions. Uh, and essentially, this plays right into the whole theme of look, people, uh, business analysts, data scientists, they need more responsive systems, but budgets are tight, obviously. Do we want to invest in a completely new infrastructure? So let's look to what we can do with our investment. So talk our, about the survey you did. Our current investments. What's the survey tell you? I mean, when you look at the survey landscape, because <coughs> you're hitting outside the IBM um, kind of show concept here, but you're talking about a lot of different industries and customers. What is the general theme on analytics and how does that relate to some of the things IBM's doing? Well, I think the general theme is that the idea of looking backwards the, the, what, at data that's, you know, that represents past performance in your business, which is really what traditional business intelligence is all about and traditional data warehousing is all about. Um, that's not going away, but what people want is a more real-time view of what's happening currently in their business and they want predictive and prescriptive analytics that tells them not, here's, not just what is likely to happen, but here's what you should do. Here's the action you should take, um, which traditional business intelligence just doesn't do. Now IBM, I think, gets this, uh, and I've actually seen quite a few, uh, a handful of sessions, I should say, not quite a few, a handful of sessions where they focus on this, um, creating an environment where you're getting prescriptive uh, recommendations on next best, best actions. Um, and that, I think, is, is a really good way to focus on this market because it's not about the insights, it's not about the data, it's not about the analytics, it's about what do I do next that's going to be, uh, that's going to drive my business forward. So that's really the general theme we're seeing and I think IBM is playing into that nicely. So, uh, Dave, I want to ask you about the, uh, some of the database trends. What are you seeing out there um, in, in database from a technology standpoint as it relates to developers? Because developers is a focus here you're hearing, you know, going back to our Twitter news, um, native apps need data, right? Data changes data, we heard that from Glenn yesterday. Speed is a concern. Um, what are you, what's your take on the database and or the software market relative to developers? So here's what I'm seeing, John, is that uh, organizations that were spending like crazy on their traditional data infrastructures, data warehouse, structured databases, SQL stuff, traditional BI, really struggling, frankly, but having to pour money just to make it get to the next step. Um, Jeff, in your speech, you mm -hmm. talked about a snake swallowing a basketball, which is a famous quote from a Wikibon practitioner. Yep. Uh, chasing the chips is what they did. <clears throat> What's happening, John, is people are essentially baselining their traditional data warehouse spend. And you can see this in the numbers of certainly Oracle, um, IBM, you know, it's flattish in the software business. And what they're doing is, instead of spending a dollar on that traditional data infrastructure, they're spending maybe 30 cents on the new infrastructure. Spinning up some POCs, doing some new R&D projects. Um, so they're not, it's not a one-to-one -one swap. They're not taking a dollar away from the traditional infrastructure, putting it into the new world. Um, they're, they're experimenting. And that's where the developers come in. The developers come in, they're saying, all right, we need the right skill sets, we need data scientists, we need rock star developers to develop this new big data stuff, <coughs> Hadoop, et cetera. Oh, and by the way, we need data integration tools and we need access to our existing data warehouse. Uh, and they're trying to figure that all out, right? So the, the organizations, there's a schism in the organization. There's the old line <laughs> data guard. They say, well, wait a minute. We have data governance, we have data structures, we have security, compliance edicts, et cetera, et cetera. And you got the new hoodies saying, Look, just give me the stuff and watch. Watch, stand back and watch the magic that I, that I create. Now, the, the, the best organizations that we see um, either don't have that baggage or they've begun to rationalize that schism. Uh, but, but clearly the, the new developer crowd is moving fast. It's a DevOps skill set. They're designing security in. Uh, they're maybe pushing the envelope a little too hard for the comfort of the traditional data warehouse crowd. Now, for, for every dollar they spend here, they spend 30 cents in the new stuff. The big question is, is there a business mo model there? And I think there is. And, and it's a, that old, we're going to make it up in volume. It reminds me of the, uh, the joke that Avi Mehta told last week in theCUBE. But if they can create three to four to five to 10x the amount of volume and activity of data, then that revenue will grow to offset that old world. Uh, if they can't, then it's going to be a problem. I think. My view, very high likelihood that they will. Well, from a 
from the perspective of the industry heavyweights, as we refer to them, you know, part of that is the volume. If they were, if they were to, to succeed in this market, can that, can that volume make up for what they're going to lose in the uh, relational database market, uh, the traditional data warehouse market, but also the other opportunity they have is in services, uh, helping people put all this stuff together. And that's where IBM is really well positioned. Steve Mills talked about that yesterday. Um, he said it's getting more complex, and I don't think the need for services is going to attenuate, my word. But well, yeah, it, it's, well, there's an interesting thing happening here where you're seeing, on the one hand, the cloud gain momentum, and that's where you take away some of the services components because you're abstracting that away. On the other hand, with big data, Moving, big data moving to the cloud is slow, slow going. I think you're shifting the services spend. Yeah, so the, away exactly. from infrastructure. It's shifting towards to big data analytics. Yeah. Absolutely, I think you're right. So I agree that, big, that services is going to remain, but you're right, it's going to shift from infrastructure to the analytics. Um, and the other place that, that I think the industry heavyweights are actually not, or actually are somewhat well positioned are, uh, and as David Floyer has pointed out as well, the companies that own the applications are companies like Oracle, SAP. And if you own the application, you own the data, uh, not own the data, literally, but you own those applications, you're in a position to uh, certainly continue to capitalize on that. So who's going to be good at that? So you know, the big whales of services, Accenture, Ernie Young, Deloitte, PwC, obviously IBM, I, I, I would put IBM at the top of that list, mm -hmm. um, are going to dominate. Uh, I would think that you'll also see some specialists emerge. Got, well, Think Big Analytics just got taken out by, uh, mm -hmm. by Teradata, but guys like Think Big, and there's a handful, small cadre of really sharp, you know, big data, Hadoop-oriented service guys. And then, you got HP, HP's big services company, but it's sort of EDS, outsourcing. Mm. Kinda, a little different model. You know, CSC-like. That to me, they, they've got to figure that out. Uh, maybe build services around Vertica, but so IBM's very well positioned there. No, probably number one. Oh, I absolutely. mean, they're number one in your report. They're number one in the overall that reason, market. Part but they have skill much sets because of that, reason, that, yeah. that others don't have. Well, right, and you know, they give, give IBM a lot of credit because they, they continue to, you know, they've been investing in the analytics space for years. Um, you know, they've got their research and development labs. I mean, they've got some of the smartest people in data science you're ever going to find. So they've made these investments. You know, this isn't new for IBM. They're not making a decision now. We've got to start investing in, in smart people related to data science. They've been doing this for years. People like Jeff Jonas, I think, is coming on later. So yeah, they're very well positioned. It's going to be a little bit more of a challenge, I think, for those services providers that are more focused on traditional infrastructure. How do you make that transition to focusing on data science and big data analytics? Because they're in the same position that companies are. They're trying, they're, there's a skill shortage out there. There aren't that many um, folks out there that really understand this stuff really well. So th they've got to attract them, uh, attract those people just like any, any other company might. So they're going to have a little bit more of a challenge, whereas IBM's been making this investment for years. This isn't years, this isn't new for them. So Jeff, I want to pivot back to uh, the news here on uh, Google and Microsoft. It's got two, two other players in the big whale space. We're not going to talk about HP for now, but Azure is hot. Um, they got the cloud, they got the same kind of analytics we're seeing here with IBM. We also see Google Conference coming up next week. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be covering the Google <laughs> cloud. So you got the compute engine, and also Amazon reInvent's coming up, so we'll be, we'll be live there as well. So, so cloud is hot, cloud is a big part of the show. Dave, I want to get your thoughts. Amazon's right around the corner. We have uh, Microsoft Azure. The public cloud of Amazon has certainly changed the game. Integrated stacks, you're hearing Steve Mills here at IBM talk about the software integration. So again, Amazon's pacing that out, but Google's a secret weapon too. They have a massive cloud, and Microsoft with Satya Nutella uh, going strong and going all in on hyper-connected enterprise, cross-platform developer tools, and certainly big data in their cloud offering. What's your take vis-a-vis -vis those guys? Well, I think that, yeah, I, I think Derek said it right. He, goes, you know, I love, he said, I love Andy Jassy. They've done the industry a great service by starting this whole trend. Amazon's cost structure is, it's to me, it's big advantage. And I would say Google and Microsoft as well. They are essentially taking what used to be infrastructure outsourcing, which was a very expensive proposition, and they're sticking it behind an API and automating it. And so the, the, the marginal economics of infrastructure outsourcing are going to start to look like software. <clears throat> so all those services that you used to acquire from CSC and IBM and EDS and everybody else, Amazon essentially created that, that capability within an API. Now, can others replicate that? Yes. Is IBM doing things that replicate that? Absolutely, that's what the soft layer acquisition was about. The cloud and acquisition is very much like a DynamoDB you know, capability. <clears throat> the big question is, can they do that 
at scale. And to the extent that they can, they can compete on a cost basis. To the extent that they can't, and by the way, they're nowhere close to Amazon scale yet. To the extent that they can't, then they have to add value other places. Take Oracle, for example. Oracle is going to get you in the red stack. They're going to, they're not, never going to have close to the scale of an Amazon, but they're going to get premium pricing for the application and the database, and they're going to make it up in margin. IBM is sort of a halfway house there. <clears throat> they're not going to... Halfway house? Oh, <laughs> a sorry. Way sta a uh, way station. Deference to, <laughs> to Pat Gelsinger. <laughs> yeah, so in That's between. an inside joke for everyone who's watching <laughs> theCUBE. That was the Pat Gelsinger famous line where I called hybrid cloud the halfway house. <laughs> yeah. That I found correct, a little Pat. offensive. And then, and then you got the fish eye from Pat <laughs> on that one. <laughs> we'll but call what, it a way station. I mean, intermediate but, point between the final destination. When I say, when I have to say halfway house, what I mean by that is, you know, IBM is, 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 is open, um, and, but it doesn't have and it certainly has the database within, with, with DB2, it doesn't have the volumes that Oracle has, it doesn't have as, ap as much application juice. Having said that, it's got a lot of SaaS products. So I think IBM can also make it up in margin. They've got the whole business outcome you know, language. Companies that talk business outcome and, to, and can deliver business outcomes tend to get higher margins. And that's the bottom line. So I think, I think IBM's strategy is a, is a good one. I think they can, they, uh, by the way, they have no other choice. They, we heard from uh, Philips earlier this year, in, in August, the edict that they're putting forth, and I think this is a, a must watch video for every CIO, how everything they're doing is going to be subscription based in the cloud. I think IBM's recognized that, they're moving in that direction. Oracle, by the way, has recognized that. I don't know, John, has HP recognized that? HP has really recognized the fact that they have to build their own cloud and build their enterprise solution around it. I think HP's behind a little bit compared to IBM. IBM's way ahead in terms of integrating in other software components. I think the foundation is solidly set at HP, so I think HP's in good shape, Dave. I got to say, from the HP Cloud event I was in San Francisco last week, they are getting it. So the leadership there uh, is strong. Um, I would give them an A on that one, good leadership. Um, their innovation engine, mm, not so much. They're banking on Cloud Foundry. They still got some work to do to wrap some innovation around it. They go to market, really strong. So I think HP's go to market, their leadership uh, is strong, and I think they understand the value proposition. Their only weak link is their innovation engine with Cloud. is still a little bit disjointed, but I hope to clear that up at HP Discover in Barcelona, but Dave, I mean, they're in good position. They're like IBM. They got a huge client base, so they just got to tool up pretty quickly. All right, excellent. Uh, Jeff, any, any last thoughts on, uh, on Insight? Well, again, it's, it's, I, I do enjoy this show because there are, there are quite a few practitioners here that are sharing their stories, so that's always fun uh, to come and hear those stories. Um, I like the name change. Insight, a little bit, little bit catchier than IOD. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Looking forward to catching a few more sessions before the day's over. Um, but really, IBM, as you mentioned, I think they're well positioned in this market, what I'm not hearing from practitioners, you know, I've talked to some attendees you know, about you know, the, the IBM's uh, issues with Wall Street and, and the buybacks, et cetera, et cetera, and, and most practitioners aren't, aren't interested in that, they're not too worried about that. Um, IBM's making this transition, uh, they know they've got to do it from kind of the old, the old model to this new model that adopts, uh, that embraces cloud and big data analytics. Uh, it's it's going to take a little bit of while, they may take a little bit of hit on Wall Street, but um, practitioners seem to be pretty excited about it, uh, they're really looking to IBM for some thought leadership, and to what I can see at this show, IBM is for the most part providing that. All right, Jeff, thanks a lot for your analysis. Dave, it's a midday break here inside theCUBE. This is theCUBE, we're live in Las Vegas for IBM Insight. Inside the special digital experience lounge, the social lounge, Insight Go, they're calling it, IBM social media team, really bring in a new digital experience together around influencers, around openness around content, really building that organic community. Uh, great job for IBM, and of course the Cube's proud to be a part of it, and we're going to be going wall to wall all day today, extracting the signal noise. We have a crowd chat up and running, crowdchat.net slash IBM Insight. We've embedded the Cube live stream in there, so you can look at that and comment, and we're going to open that up for the whole world to watch and make comments, so please join us. Uh, we'll be right back, we'll be here all day. You got any questions, put it in on the crowd chat, we'll answer them. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>